Good morning. Happy to have everybody here. We pray that you will have a blessing from attending this morning. Uh, we do have some announcements. CWF, the Christian Women's Fellowship, will meet this coming Saturday. And we are doing a uh, Italian theme. Uh, and uh, so we do have two casseroles already and um, a vegetable and French bread coming. Or not French bread, garlic bread. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we still need tea and uh, some vegetables and dessert. Uh, so anyway, if you would like to come, you're welcome to come. And uh, please let me know what you're planning to bring. We are, uh, as I said, we're going to have this uh, kind of an Italian theme, but it's not critical if you want to bring something else. Also, uh, you'll notice we'll have one up here. We're going to, uh, we've been doing this in the past and then it kind of gotten, or had gotten uh, delayed a little bit with the Corona stay. This is for the food pantry. One of the things that our church does is we bring shampoo and soaps. So uh, <clears throat> this size you can get at Dollar Tree. Uh, okay. And so uh, if you will, remember to bring those and put them in the basket and this will be shampoo and uh, soap. Anything else, uh, Marsha? Uh, deodorant, uh, also uh, dishwashing soap besides oh. the uh, shampoo and conditioner. Okay. So dishwashing soap and deodorant also would be very appreciated. Uh, do we have any other announcements? Yes. There will be a uh, education youth committee meeting directly after the services today. So if you would like to participate, you are more than welcome to stay. And we are trying to get our youth and children's programs up and running again after the COVID fiasco. So if you have any ideas, if you would like to volunteer or you just want to see what we are planning, please come and enjoy some time that we can all share ideas. Thank you. Okay. And Pastor Rick has some things he wants to say to us. Yes. Yes. Um, the, uh, the Education Committee meeting has already been mentioned. We normally meet Thursdays at 10 for the pastor's class. We're doing a study on prayer. It's, uh, I hope you'll come even if you haven't come yet. But this week... I have some major dental work on Thursday, so pray for me. Uh, but also, Tuesday is when we're going to have class this particular week. It's normally on Thursdays, Tuesday at 10, so I hope you'll come be a part of that. Many of you have asked questions about the one-year Bible, and uh, I told you we'd start signing up today, so I want to tell you how we're going to do that. The first thing I want to do is, um, is show you the difference in the way verses are, because I think sometimes people are intimidated by Scripture, and part of that is if we're a certain age, we, we were raised on the King James Version, which is about a, a 12th grade reading level, and it's not easy to understand. So I want to show you about five verses. I'm going to take a little bit of time and let you help you decide which translation you would like. We're not even going to offer the King James Version because it is difficult, but we are going to offer the NIV, the New International Version, or the NLT, the New Living Translation. And so I want to give you some examples so you can decide which one you'd like to use, all right? So Psalm 1-1, King James. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. New International Version says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. New Living Translation Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. Okay, so you can kind of see what's easier to read. I want to show you like four other examples, though. Here's, here's Psalm 41. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The international, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The New Living Translation. Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. Okay, keep going. Amos 4, 6. And here's an example. Uh, King James, and all, I also have given you cleanness of teeth. This is God speaking. Well, cleanness of teeth in the Hebrew is an idiom. It means you're hungry. But you wouldn't know that based on this translation. Also, uh, cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. New International Version, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. New Living Translation, I brought hunger to every city and famine to every town, but still you would not return to me, 
says the Lord. Two more examples. This is from the book of Romans, which Romans is Paul's theological, doctrinal thing. This is what I believe, but sometimes it's really hard to understand. So here's the King James Version. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. You might be going, what's he trying to say? New International Version. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. New Living Translation. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. That one in particular, doesn't the last one make it so much easier to understand? Okay, one more example. Romans 8, 29, King James Version. For whom God did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. New International. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. New Living Translation. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Once again, the last one makes it so much easier to me. I preach out the New International Version. I love it. But I just wanted you to see the difference. And now, here's what I want you to do. On the back of your connection card, and everybody needs to fill it out, there's a line at the bottom of the back that says RSVP. If you want to sign up to participate beginning January 1st to read the Bible, and I hope everybody will sign up. Put the words, uh, put the letters OYB for one year Bible. And then out beside it, put NIV if you want the New International Version, or NLT if you'd like a copy of the New Living Translation. If you want us to order you one, you'll pay for it in December. They're $15. We also have somebody who's generously given us 13 or 14 copies. So if you can't afford it, we're gonna, you're going to get one anyway, okay? So don't worry about the cost. But I hope you'll sign up and participate. A few of you have said that you want to either buy your own, so we, won't, no, we don't need to order, or use a Bible you already have, which means each week we'll put the different scriptures. But I hope most of you will buy one of these because I think it'll be easier. You can highlight, you can put questions, you can really get into reading God's Word. So if you want to buy your own or you want to use your own Bible, just write, write the word participate. That way we'll know you're going to participate in the one-year Bible campaign starting in January, even though you're not going to buy one through the church. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay, I know that took a little while, but I think it's important, so I wanted to cover that this morning. So if you'll stand now, you got to sit through that at least, okay? As we observe our call to worship this morning, I light the candle, the Christ candle, which is always a symbol of Christ. He is the light of the world. He's the reason we're gathered here and also represents the presence of His Holy Spirit with us. And so for our call to worship this morning, selected verses from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go? and meet with God. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let's sing about panting for the Lord as living water together, so we remain standing. Me again. Uh, this is the time for the elders moment, and I am one of the elders, and uh, I think I know everybody, but uh, my name is Kathy Lutz, or, and um, this morning I'm going to talk about a devotional that was in uh, the, our daily bread, and talks about a servant hearing. It said, had the wireless radio been on, they would have known the Titanic was sinking. Cyril Evans, the radio operator of another ship, had tried to relay a message to uh, Jack Phillips, who was the operator on the Titanic, letting him know that they had encountered an ice field. But Phillips was busy relaying passengers' messages, 
and told Evans he didn't want to talk right then. So I kind of wondered at this point why he didn't just send it really clearly. There's an ice field. But, uh, so Evans reluctantly turned off his radio and went to bed. Ten minutes later, the Titanic struck an iceberg. Their distress signals went unanswered because no one was listening. In 1 Samuel, we read that the priests of Israel were corrupt and had lost their spiritual insight and hearing as a nation and had drifted into danger. The word of the Lord was rare and there were not many visions, yet God would not give up on his people. He began to speak to a young boy named Samuel, who was being raised in the priest household. Samuel's name means the Lord hears, a memorial to his mother or answering his mother's prayer. But Samuel would need to learn how to hear God. Speak, for your servant is listening. It's the servant who hears. May we choose to listen and to obey what God has revealed in the scriptures. Let us submit our lives to him and take the posture of humble servants who have the radios on. There are many ways to stay tuned into God. We can do this through prayer. We can read the scriptures through sermons, maybe through devotionals that we read, but most important is that we do stay connected, that our radio is turned on at all times, and that we take the effort to really listen to what God is saying. We want to make sure that our hearts are always tuned in to what God has to say for us. Uh, so if you will bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for still speaking to us. We ask you to be with us, to open our hearts and our minds to all of the blessings that you have for us and help us to stay connected to you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace of Christ. Oh, forgot the little, uh, <laughs> let's see. That's over here, I guess. Uh, the peace of Christ is a symbol of reconciliation that is expressed through a greeting. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also, also with you. you. Stand up, greet your neighbors. Go together to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that we would all become more sensitive, more aware to the work that you are doing. You never stop working, Lord. You're working in people's hearts and lives and in the world all around us. Sometimes we're just so focused on our own life and our own problems and we just don't see what you're doing. And, and Jesus said, he looked to see what you were doing and he joined you in what you were doing. That's, that's what you call us to do, Lord. So I pray as we continue this series going through and, and figuring out and learning more about how you speak to our hearts, how you speak to us still today, that we will learn how to discern your spirit and we will learn how to move out in faith. And we will do what I was talking about a minute ago. We'll be looking for the work that you're doing and we will be willing to speak the word that you give us um, into that situation. Speak words of encouragement and help and comfort, just like you are, Lord. You are the God of mercy, the Father of all comfort. That's what your word says, and that's what we need. And that's what all these situations we already spoke of this morning, Lord, that's what they all need. They need your mercy. They need your comfort. They need your strength. We pray for all the people who have been affected by um, this hurricane, Lord, just just... Lord, just ask that you would surround them with your loving arms and give them the, what they need during this time. And they would feel your love and concern for them even in the midst of all that they're going through, and especially because of that, Lord. We pray for that. We pray for our country as we go move toward an election uh, that our country is more divided, I think, Lord, than I've ever seen it. And I pray, Father, for your peace that passes understanding in the midst of political um, issues that are going on, Lord, um, and guide and direct the whole process, I pray, Lord, and also all the uh, fomenting of violence and, and agitation and everything going on in our country, Lord, help people to see something better than all of that, something more important than all of that, something that transcends all of that. 
and that's you. So we lift all this up to you. And all the unspoken requests in our hearts, Lord, we know you have our best intentions at heart. As Paul said, you are for us and not against us. And we praise you for that. And so we lift our prayers up to you and we speak out loud from our hearts the very words Jesus himself taught us to pray as we pray in the name of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But verily, truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in him. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can know now bear. But when he, the spirit of the truth, come, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is for me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. The word for the Lord, for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Praise the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You may be seated. Um, I asked George this morning to share with us before I preach, so he's going to share a song with us. <clears throat> There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Lord, your presence there's healing divine know the power can save Lord but thine Holy Spirit thou art well come in this place thou art well come in Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let's pray once more. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place, in our hearts, in our lives. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. You are our strength and our redeemer. We looked 
at God speaking to us through His Word last Sunday. And today, I want us to think about listening for God through His Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who not only walks alongside us as a never-ending friend and companion, but actually resides within us, within our spirits, as an internal guide and compass for us. And so just as God speaks to us through His written Word, the Bible, He also speaks to us through the living Word, Jesus, through the power and presence of His Spirit within us. So in our Christian walk, we seek to hear God speak to us both through His written Word and the living Word within us. And one of the primary ways, but certainly not the only way, of making that connection between us and the Spirit is through prayer. And you know, we've been talking about prayer at the pastor's Bible study. Here's what we need to say, see. When it comes to prayer, what God has to say to us is infinitely more important than what we have to say to Him. We're talking about listening for God. Uh, yet we generally, when we pray, most uh, this happens in my life too, we, we tend to monopolize the conversation. I mean, have you ever considered God already knows everything we are telling Him, yet we continue talking rather than letting Him tell us things we do not know? The single greatest reason to pray is to take the focus away from us and our problems and turn it to God. As our lives are swallowed up in the problems and details of living in this world, we often become overwhelmed. I know you've probably felt that. I know I have. We are finite. We're weak creatures. What we need is a proper perspective. And so God gives this to us when He draws our minds away from our needs and toward His character and all that He is. Because we're not the center of the universe. God is. And prayer is the process by which God helps us rearrange our priorities to match what is important to Him. The motivating impulse of our praying should not primarily be what is on our heart, but what is on God's heart. Now, that doesn't mean God's not interested in what's on your heart. He loves you. Jesus did teach us we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. But the more important plea that He made is the one at the beginning of the prayer. God, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is not designed as a means for us to change God. It's primarily a time for God to change us. And for that to happen, we have to have ears to hear what He's trying to say to us. The key to God transforming us is not found in what we say as we pray, but in what we hear. You know, we, we end uh, our prayers with the phrase, in Jesus' name. That's because in the Scripture it says, if you pray anything in my name. But have you ever stopped to think what that means? It, it's not some magical formula. And it shouldn't be some meaningless ritual, which it has a tendency to do, that we do because it's what we've always heard or what we've been taught. Think about it. To pray something in Jesus' name means to pray it with His support, with His blessing. In other words, when we say in Jesus' name, we are saying as best as we know, the prayer we're praying is the exact same prayer Jesus Himself is praying for us. It's asking God to accomplish His heart's desire, not our heart's. So prayer is a very important way that God speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. But it's not the only way. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives is vitally important as Christians. I don't have time to give you a detailed analysis of the 
following points. You wouldn't want me to take that much time. But let me just remind you of some of the things the Bible tells us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So this is more like a teaching moment instead of a preaching moment. And there's so many more I could list. But since we're talking about listening to the Holy Spirit, I think it's important for us to remember what is it that the Holy Spirit does in our lives as Christians. So the first one is the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit persistently works in our hearts to bring us to repentance about the sin in our life which grants us forgiveness and restores our relationship, our fellowship with God. We think of that when we get saved or when we first come to Christ. We think, well, He convicted me of my sin. I don't know. It's an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to convict us of sin in our lives so that we can repent and we can have fellowship with God. The second thing, the Holy Spirit brings understanding. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. I don't have to tell you, there's a lot of voices out there trying to get our attention. The world is filled with voices seeking to convince you that reality is what they say it is. Whether it's through TV, mediums, computer, whatever. The voice of the world is trying to get our attention, or the voices of the world. So how do you know what's true? You must rely on the Spirit of truth. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit brings comfort. Paul said, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the... Oh, pardon me. Pardon me, the Holy Spirit brings comfort. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming for you or to you. You're not orphans. Jesus said, you know, orphans, they're all out on their own. But in Christ, you never are. God loves you. He knows you intimately. He knows how to pick you up when you fall. And He wants to comfort you when you grieve. He's a God of comfort through the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit protects us from sin. This is where Paul said, Paul said, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. See, that's important. The Holy Spirit doesn't just convict us after we've sinned. He helps protect us from sinning in the first place. Fifthly, the Holy Spirit produces fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. You know where he lists the fruit. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the rest. That's the kind of fruit the Holy Spirit is supposed to be and should be and will produce in our lives if we let Him. Some people excuse I've heard, and I can't say I haven't used the excuse myself. Some people excuse their unchrist like behavior with comments such as, well, that's just the way I am. Well, you know what? Christ died for you so you don't have to stay the way you are. He helps to change us to be more like Him. Anybody want to say an amen to that? Amen. All right. Thank you. All right. Sixthly, the Holy Spirit places members. This one's very exciting to me. When Paul's talking about us as the body of Christ, here's what he said. But now God has placed the parts, each one of them, in the body just as He wanted. Paul said the Holy Spirit's the one responsible for placing each person in the church to serve where God knows is best. And the Spirit also equips each member to carry out his or her role in the body of Christ for the common good. That's what the gifts of the Spirit. And that's what's so exciting when somebody joins the church because that means God's bringing them our way for a reason that will bless both them and the body as a whole. The Holy Spirit puts that all together. He places the members. Seventhly, the Holy Spirit produces unity. Paul says, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. Look at the disparity in their body. Whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Let me ask you, how likely is unity within 
the church? How likely is unity within a church body, no matter what its size? Well, without God's help, it's no more likely than world peace. Okay? But thanks to the Holy Spirit, it's not only possible, it ought to be the norm. And eighthly, the Holy Spirit reminds us. Jesus said, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. See, the role of the Holy Spirit today is not to write Scripture. That's all been done. Now He wants to apply that Scripture to our hearts. And He reminds us what God has already revealed. And then He applies those truths to our lives. He speaks to us. So, if that's just examples of all the things the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, how do we put ourselves in a position to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us? How how do we hear His voice better? First of all, friendship. Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. Now I call you friends. See, friendship is based on intimacy, really knowing somebody. And the deeper the intimacy and knowledge, the deeper the friendship. And that's what God wants with you and me. Jesus said it. He wants a friendship. Not only a friendship, but availability. You know, true friends, close friends, are available. They are the people you would call at 2 o'clock in the morning if you had an emergency. And see, we, we know that God is available to us. The question is, are we available to God? Are we willing to do what He asks us to do? See, God comes to us because He wants a relationship, but sometimes we only want results. He wants to talk, but we only want Him to fix things. And it's not that He is against results or that He minds fixing things. But more than that, he desires a friend who's available. And finally, on hearing God, humility. When God sees in our heart of hearts that we are actually willing to do whatever he says, he will speak to us. Why should he speak to us if he knows we won't do What do you ask? Humble people put their confidence in the Holy Spirit's ability to speak, not in their ability to hear. And in Christ's ability to lead, not in their ability to follow. And if we're ever going to hear His voice, we must embrace humility. Jesus was humble in heart, and so are all of his intimate friends. So if we're seeking or willing to seek intimacy with God as with a friend, if we will make ourselves available to God with a willingness to do whatever he tells us or asks us to do, and if we set our hearts to pursue humility, he will speak to us. And God himself approaches us in great humility. If he didn't, we wouldn't be able to stand in his presence. There's nothing more humble than a baby. And that's how God came to us in Jesus. So how do I know? How do I know when it's the Spirit that's speaking to me? And this is an important thing because I've had people ask me before, how can I be sure when I... When I hear something on the inside, I want to trust that it's God. How do I know? You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. Paul talks about the unholy Trinity. The world 
the flesh, and the devil, the evil one. We already talked about the world. It's already trying to get us off course by shooting. But what, how do we know if it's the Holy Spirit that speaks to us or whether maybe it's the evil one speaking to us? Well, here's some things. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, He does not whine or nag or argue. His voice is calm and quiet and confident. It, it, it's not mean or condemning. See, many Christians mistake the condemnation and the accusation of the devil for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When the devil speaks to us about our sins, he makes us feel worthless. He makes us feel condemned. He nags and he whines. And his impressions make us feel like we've always been this way and we'll never change. And when we confess our sins, he tells us that we've done that before. We're not sincere. We've confessed them and yet we keep on doing them. And that we simply end up doing those things over and over and over again. And so he condemns us. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, he confronts us with the reality of our sin, but He brings hope through our relationship with Jesus. He wants to bring us back to that relationship. Well, what about, what about our own self-talk? Talking to ourselves. How do we distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from the voice of our own subconscious? E. Stanley Jones, famous Methodist uh, evangelist and missionary, said this, Perhaps the distinction is this. The voice of the subconscious argues with you, tries to convince you, but the inner voice of God does not argue, does not try to convince you. It just speaks, and it is self-authenticating. It has the feel of the voice of God within. It's a spirit of peacefulness and confidence. So just like last week, I want to give you, I'm going to give you several examples. It may take a while, but I'm sorry. This is important. And stories are just a good way of showing how God speaks to us through certain ways. And one, this one through the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible story. In China, during the counter-revolution that began in 1949 through Mao Zedong, where they obliterated all American missionaries, destroyed churches, took away Bibles... And yet there was still an underground church in China. In fact, the, the amazing thing is the missionaries thought, oh, well, it's the end of the church. No, the church grew by leaps and bounds without any of those missionaries there through the persecution. And there was one woman who was a Christian secretly who worked at a mine, and she heard a voice calling her by name. It was her job to blow the whistle to call the workers out of the mine when it was time for the shift to end. And it was an hour before the shift was supposed to end. And she heard a voice call her by name and say, blow the whistle now. And she didn't want to do that because she knew that would get her in trouble. But it kept saying persistently, blow the whistle now. She finally blew the whistle. An hour early, all the workers came out of the mine. And as soon as the last worker came out of the mine, there was an earthquake and caved in several of the shafts and the death toll would have been staggering. And the miners gathered around this girl to ask her why she'd blown the whistle. And so she had to admit she was a Christian. And she basically said, God told me to blow the whistle. And hundreds of people accepted the Lord that day in the midst of communist aggression. And then at the official inquiry, she gave the same testimony. And several more people gave their heart to Christ. Here's another incredible example. Years ago, Dave Phillips and his wife Lynn had a talk about the callings that they felt of God on their life, and they discussed what they were most passionate about, and the thing they agreed is that uh, they wanted to try to bring relief to suffering children and reach the next generation with the gospel. That was at the top of the list. And the thought of starting a relief agency was, seemed so overwhelming, but finally, after a few weeks, they began to start that relief agency. It's called the Children's Hunger Fund. They did it out of their garage. And just six weeks into the beginning of that ministry, he received a phone call from a director of a cancer treatment center in Honduras asking if there was any way that he could obtain a certain drug and told the director that he had no idea how he would get that type of drug. He wrote it down, but seven children were going to die if they didn't get that drug. And as he hung up the phone, before he even let go of the receiver, 
The phone rang again. It was a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey asking Dave if, if he would have any use for 48,000 vials of that exact drug. Not only did they offer him $8 million worth of this drug, but they told him they would airlift it to any place in the world that he needed it taken. And Dave found out later that they were one of only two companies in the United States that manufactured that particular drug. Within 48 hours, Dave had the drug sent to the treatment center in Honduras and to 20 other locations as well. Amazing. Now, not quite so miraculous, I want to share a few more real quickly. When my younger son Nathan was 15 months old, he contracted meningitis. I may have shared this with some of you before. And uh, we didn't know he had meningitis. He came home from the nursery, church nursery that day, very lethargic. I called his doctor. I remember there was a cowboy playoff game on the TV. And the doctor said, well, you know, just give him a tepid bath and just do what you can and bring him to see me in the morning. We started giving him a tepid bath, and, and we'd call his name, and his eyes would roll. He couldn't even open his eyelids. And I remember saying, we're taking him to the hospital now. And I believe that was God. I took him to the hospital. Uh, the next, they, you know, by the next morning, they had diagnosed meningitis. He was in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, but I, uh, the doctor said if we hadn't brought him in, more than likely he would have died. And I had, by Monday, that was Sunday, by Monday, I'm praying to God, I had a peace. I didn't know what that peace meant. I didn't know that meant for sure that Nathan was going to live and make it, but I had a peace. And, and I know God spoke to me that way. When I pastored a church, uh, the last part of the 90s, we had a prayer ministry at the end of every service, and we'd have people stand at the doors at the back, one woman, one man, and just tell people, if you're here today, you need a prayer, these people are here for you. And a really good friend, a real prayer warrior of a lady, prayed with a woman that morning. The woman came in, shared some concerns she had that she needed prayer for. And that lady began to pray. And as she's praying, she starts praying for this woman's mother. And the woman begins sobbing. And the thing is, the woman had never mentioned her mother as a prayer request. And after the prayer was over, found out that her mother had called her that morning threatening to commit suicide. That's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to somebody's heart. Um, I, I know this is taking long, but I want to give you two other quick examples, okay? Um, I shared this with the Bible study group. Three or four weeks ago, I was having some real temptation in my life. Real and, you know, I told you last week, I, I used a verse, I, Rick's son, consider myself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. God used that. And there were a couple of times that week that I know God was there for me. And I heard in my spirit, God say to me, Rick, I'm proud of you. Now, let me tell you why that's so important. Every, every hard time I've gone through in my life, and I've gone through a lot, I have never, I can't remember a time I ever doubted that God loved me, because first of all, I had a mom that loved me so much that, you know, just, my dad, bless his heart, he was a, he was a good man in so many ways, he took us to church, helped me memorize scripture and everything, and I, I never remember my dad being proud of me, and never, he never said those words. One time I, I remember feeling like he was proud of me, but even then he had some uh, examples of ways I could do better, Okay. <laughs> So for God to say to me, now those words would not have come into my head. Rick, I'm proud of you. That was the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to give you one more from this past week. See, I'm going to be current. This, this shows a failure on my part. Uh, that's why I want to share with you. Remember I told you God had shown me how you put his work with his word and combine them? I was in line at the 7-Eleven down here at 46 and 281 to buy a newspaper and something else. And there was, a, there was a couple in front of me. I don't know if they were brother, sister, friends, married, whatever. But a man and a woman, pretty young, probably in their 20s, maybe early 30s. And they had set their red slush and their blue slush and maybe some other things down on the counter. 
and they just left them there and they walked out. And I thought, they must not have their cash with them. So I checked out, but in my heart, I know God was saying, give some money to that couple. And so they happened to be parked right next to my car as I go out. And I can tell they're frantically looking in their car, maybe looking for change, looking for money they've lost, I don't know. And the guy was the one on the passenger side. I just tapped him on the shoulder. I took out some money in my billfold, and I said, here, I want to give this to you. And he said, really? Are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. I want you to have it. And then I got in my car, and I could tell the woman on the side was very touched. She, could, you know, she was looking at me like, thank you. Now, here's what I didn't do. I didn't take the opportunity to join the work of God with the Word of God. I could have said, you know, God's been so good to me, I just wanted to be good to you because of His goodness to me. I could have done something to give God the glory, okay? So that's what we need to be looking for. And that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I mean, do you think God's smarter than you are? See, God knows things and He sees things from His perspective that we can't possibly know from our own perspective. And He's the one who can make lines intersect that are on a parallel course. He's the one that can intersect lives in a real way that makes a real difference. But only if we're willing to listen. So what does God the Holy Spirit want to say to you right now? What's He telling you? We're going to stand in just a moment, and we're going to sing um, God is Good All the Time. It's kind of a peppy song. But if you're here this morning and you need a prayer, the Holy Spirit said something to your heart, and you want to pray with the pastor, or if you have a decision you want to make, joining the church or whatever God's put on your heart, would you do that as we stand together? So praise team.